So yes, I'm going to work uh, to present the work, which is really uh, the interpolation between work of a number of students, Thomas Inglès and uh, Mathieu Andreu, but also of an old collaboration with uh, Joan uh, Brunat and uh, Six Zong. So the whole problem will be, can we try to understand a little bit better these amazing deep generative networks? So, of course, the problem that we are tackling here is the problem of unsupervised learning. Namely, what we would like to do is to learn the probability distribution P of X of a random vector in high dimension D, given a number reasonable of uh, realizations. So, as we've seen already in the last two days, there has been absolutely spectacular results obtained with really a jungle of architectures. Uh, all kinds of architectures from uh, uh, generative adversarial networks, autoencoders. In the time series world, you have the recurrent neural network, wave nets. And the only difficulties of these uh, beautiful realizations is that they are very difficult to train if you are not versed in the art because you have two networks that are playing one against the other. And the second point, of course, is that we understand very little about the mathematics which is behind. So the two questions that I'll try to address is first, can we simplify these algorithms? And can we relate them to existing mathematics or is it something completely born again which is coming out of nowhere? So let me briefly remind you, generative adversarial network. So the idea of the generative uh, process is that it's going to begin from a random vector, typically whose size is about 100, and then you have a deep convolutional network which is going to generate images, and uh, that's originally from the publication of Jan Goodfellow, their collaborators. And then, of course, you have this discriminative network which is going to take an image, and whose goal is to distinguish between the original images from the training sets and the images that have been generated by the generative network. And the two networks play one against the other, and you have a penalty which basically tries to maximize the discrimination of the discriminator network, and the generator tries to trick the generative network, producing the best generated images. Now, the arguments of uh, Jan Goodfellow and his collaborators is that basically this should work, because if you look at the probability distribution that has, which is going to describe the resulting uh, uh, generative process, while well, the optimal discriminator is going to be defined by the ratio of the probability distribution divided by the sum of the two if you've been able to learn an optimal discriminator. And given that, if you then try to optimize the generator, you will see that the cost function is basically going to minimize a curlback distance between, which is a kind of symmetrized curlback divergence, between the estimated probability distribution and the average of the two. Now, if you try to minimize that, then it leads to the fact that you are going to converge to the right probability distribution, which will be equal to the probability distribution of P. Wonderful. Wonderful, but there is a huge but, is that this is totally untractable. In other words, to establish the distance of two probability distributions in high dimension, in particular strong divergence such as kullback Liebler divergence, as it has been shown in a number of publications, in particular the last one of Aurora, is totally intractable, means that the number of examples you need is going to uh, increase exponentially with the dimension, and the class of discriminator that you need to look at is going to be also much too big. And that's the same if you replace the kullback liebler divergence by uh, Wasserstein distance. Now, this being said, there have been very beautiful results. As you know, this comes from the paper of Radford and Chintala. So on bedrooms, you can synthesize a bedroom f after a training from one noise signals, another one from the other noise signals. And the beauty of it is that if you then interpolate between these two input random vectors, so you do a linear interpolation in the input space, the output is going to look like a bedroom all over. That's the average bedroom, as if you had completely linearized this pseudo-manifold of bedrooms. 
And that works for much more complex uh, structures, of course, including uh, faces. This is a video of faces in, in the interpolation, and you see how things gracefully uh, uh, deform one into the other. Okay, then there has been other, uh, for example, adversarial autoencoders, kind of, where you have the encoder, and in the variational encoder version, the goal of the encoder is to produce an embedded space which looks like a Gaussian white noise. And in order to do that, you are going to try to minimize the cost. And again, the cost is going to be the distance between the conditional probability distribution and here a Gaussian white noise. This is very nice, but again, this is totally intractable. Any distance uh, uh, with a strong norms such as uh, kullback leibler uh, divergence in high dimension of a probability distribution, you just cannot estimate it. Still, it does work, and on the other hand, the encoder is simply defined as a minimization of a regression. In other words, you try to reconstruct the best possible approximation of x from your g, and this is a perfectly tractable uh, solution. The only thing is that it has a tendency to produce blurred images. So people have come out with ideas and replacing the L2 metric with what has been called perceptual distances, which do give better results, sharper images. Then you have the world of time series. So in time series, the idea, of course, is you have causality. So the idea is to factorize your probability distribution as a product of conditional probability distribution. That's uh, the classical factorization, and then try to model these conditional probability distributions. So several architecture have been proposed, recurrent neural network, LSTM, and in particular wave nets, which are basically convolutional autoregressive models. So that's the figure coming out of their paper. It looks very simple, but really it's complex. Any of these dots corresponds to a pretty complicated uh, gated uh, operation. There is here hidden a multi-layer network which is going to aggregate the, all the information, but the fact is it gives amazing synthesis. The only problem of the previous uh, synthesis is that it synthesized sample one after the other, so that was too slow for real time. So they produced an even more complex architecture where the pre previous a uh, wave net is now a teacher, which is training a wave net student, which is now taking a little bit like uh, a GAN or uh, an autoencoder. It's taking now as an input uh, a Gaussian white noise, and it produces by aligning the conditional probability distribution with the one that were calculated with the teacher, it does produce very good results, and now it's fully convolutional, so it can be calculated in parallel. Great result, but that's even harder. I don't think anybody has been able to reproduce numerically these results coming out of uh, Google. So, what is the challenge? The challenge that I propose here is to try to model these uh, stochastic processes with a generator, a deep network generator, from white noise, so exactly like all these techniques do, but without learning anything else. In other words, without learning a discriminator, without learning an encoder, without learning an embedding, but by using prior information about the probability distribution. Of course, if you can do that, then it gets computationally and mathematically much simpler to analyze what's happening. So that will be our goal. Uh, there are several elements attached to it. You want to define a tractable mathematical framework, but you'd like to relate it to past work in math on probabilistic model. This notion of perceptual distance is not very natural. After all, you don't care about perception if you are doing physics. The only thing you care is about reproducing a good approximation of your probability distribution. And you would like to have the same kind of architecture to produce images and time series. So incorporate uh, causality into it and boom, get exactly the same kind of results. So that's going to be the tentative program uh, of the talk. So the first problem is to avoid the intractable 
step. Now, what is the intractable step? Is the step where you are going to try to estimate a probability distribution. And in this case, if you think of the autoencoder, it's the step where you try to build an embedding space where everything looks Gaussian. So we are going to replace it by prior information. What I'm saying is that we are going to try to use prior information on the probability distribution P of what you try to model in order to define an operator which is going to nearly Gaussianize your random process. If you can do that, then you kill the intractable step. Once you have Gaussianized, then it's very easy to whiten out your Gaussian process. You just have to estimate the covariance. So you can do that with a linear operator. Once you have done that, then the decoder consists in taking a Gaussian white noise and inverting these two operators. So first you invert your linear operator. That's going to be easy. The real difficult part is going to in invert this encoder. And that will be my generator. So the whole issue is to invert this predefined embedding operators. And what you want is that for any realization of x, g of phi of x should be approximately equal to x. Now, we use the same strategy as an autoencoder. We are going to learn this as a deep network in order to minimize the Euclidean distance. The only thing is that like perceptual metrics, we are going to use a discriminative operator here. So what's the function of this discriminator? The function of this discriminator is to make sure that if g of phi x, in other words, the reconstruction doesn't belong to the probability distribution of x, then this distance should be relatively large. And this distance is computed with a Euclidean distance. So d essentially has the same kind of role as the embedding. It has to translate a distribution which is absolutely not Gaussian into something which satisfies a Euclidean norm, so it looks a little bit more Gaussian. The only thing is that we would like this to be invertible. And so the whole question will be to see how can we define an invertible version of phi. OK. So that's the kind of strategy of what we're going to do. Question now. What kind of prior information do we have on the probability distribution? Very often, we know that P of x is either locally or globally invariant to translation not always globally. It is very often nearly invariant to local deformation. You deform an image, it looks like itself, like it sounds. There could be many other symmetries. We are not going to use any, of the, uh, any others that was mentioned in the problems in physics. Other type of information, all typical realization effects, in other words, typical images produced by your random processes, we are going to use the fact that they are sparse in a known dictionary. So we are going to use prior information about sparsity. That's the prior information. Now, how are we going to Gaussianize our random process? Now, there is an easy way to Gaussianize is to average. So that's what we are going to do. We are going to build a big vector, nonlinear vector representing x. And then we are going to average this big vector, either in space, if it's an image, or in time, of a sufficiently large time domain so that it gets Gaussianized, OK? Now, the whole problem now is to define this vector u of x. Now, what do we need about u? It should be in covariant to translation because p of x may be locally or globally invariant to translation stable to deformation because of the property of p. So that tells us that u has to separate the different scale information in x. Scale separation, so we are going to use wavelets to do that. Now, we need to invert phi of x because the goal is going to be to build a generator which is going to invert phi of x. Inverting phi of x means inverting this which has been average over a large domain. 
So it's a kind of deconvolution problem over a very large vector, okay? For this, if u of x is sparse, we know that that kind of inverse problem can become stable, uh, stable, yes. So we'll try to have u of x sparse. If we compute u of x with wavelets, then we'll have to choose wavelets which build a sparse representation. Everything together, I'm going to show you that you can build this with something that we call the wavelet scattering transform. And then I'm going to show results on images and audio signals. Okay, so now I'm going to spend about five, 10 minutes to explain you this wavelet scattering transform. So what is a wavelet? A wavelet here is a local sine wave, okay, that you are going to dilate at different scale. So it's a complex wave. This is the imaginary part. And that you are going to rotate like a sine wave to get all orientations. Now we are going to take the image and we are going to filter the image with each of these wavelets. So if you take this filter, you are going to get a very sparse response. So you're going to get a sparse representation. And we are going to do that for all scales and all angles. And the complement is going to be the average of x. That's the low frequencies that's separated from all the rest. I'm going to show you here a wavelet transform. So this is the scale. These are the fine scale information in different angles. And the next scale, next scale, and so on. Now for audio, we are going to do exactly the same thing. So in an audio signal, you have a 1D time signal. We are going to get a wavelet dilated by multiple scale factors. So for audio signals, you need about 10 to 16 intermediate scale to get a good frequency resolution. And then essentially you do the same thing. You get all your high frequency coefficient with your dilated wavelets and the low frequency. And you can show that you have a conservation of energy. So that's how it looks like. These are classical spectrogram. This is time. This is the wavelet frequency parameter. And you see you get something very sparse, which outline all the harmonic structure of your image. OK, so why would we need a deep architecture to build this embedding? So our goal is to compute this u of x such that if you average u of x with phi, it's going to be nearly invertible. So you could try to use for u of x just x. But if you average x, you lose all the high frequencies and you are dead. You will never be able to recover them. Now, where are the high frequencies? The high frequencies, they are captured by wavelets coefficients. If you take these wavelet coefficients and you average them, you get zero because this is oscillatory. So that's where you need a nonlinearity. So we are going to take the absolute value. We take the absolute value of this coefficient. Now we've added a component to u. And if you average, you get these two elements. But now these coefficients, they've lost information because of the average. So you would like to recover the information which was lost. Where is it? Well, the information that is lost here these are the high frequencies of the modulus of the wavelet coefficients. We are going to recover them with their high frequencies calculated with a new wavelet transform. And so you do a second wavelet transform. And that gives you basically an architecture of a deep net. This is the first wavelet transform. Each component, you re-decompose it. You compute the next wavelet coefficients that you re-decompose redecompose, and so on. And at the output of your network, you get coefficients which are basically averaged of convolution with a wavelet modulus, a second modulus, and so on. OK, so that's what we call a scattering transform. Now, last thing, what are the properties? What we did is we took the signal and we applied these operators, wavelet transform, modulus, and so on. All these operators, they are nonlinear contractive operators. So there are two properties that are going to come out. If you iterate this, you are going to get something which is contractive. And the second property is that you are going to get something which is stable by deformation. The reason is that wavelets are stable by deformation. So if you take your signal, you just deform it a little bit. 
in the scattering domain, if you apply a stupid Euclidean distance, the distance is going to be of the order of the deformation. OK, now what about doing again unsupervised learning? So this is a representation of our random process. OK, I'm just going to get two orders. Now, if you increase the averaging, because you are going to average coefficients that are going to become nearly independent when they are far away, if you have a bit of ergodicity, when the scale, the averaging, goes to infinity, it's going to converge to the expected value of these quantities, because you average them. And on the way, it's going to become Gaussian. This is the central limit theorem. OK, so now there is two strategies. One, which is the usual strategy that is used in statistical physics. We are going to average everything to the maximum you can. So you average everything to the whole signal size. If you do that, then Sj is going to concentrate very close to the expected value. In other words, your distribution was initially very large. The scattering transform sends you very close to the mean. That means that you contract everything, any realization, any phase, anything, they are all going to come together very close to a single realization. What can you do? What you can do is to build a max entropy model, maximum entropy model. The idea is the following. You have one example, one measurement. That's the only thing you know. So what you can say is that your random process is the set of all possible signal x, such as the scattering transform is going to be very close to your observation. And you can define a probability distribution which is uniform in this set. This is called a microcanonical model. So let me show you how it looks like on images. These are textures. That's the work with Joan Brunard. These are Gaussian models. And that's what you can get. Now, it looks good, but that works really because you see your random process is very ergodic. There is no big structure. It's not at all like in GAN or uh, processes obtained with variational autoencoders. I'm going to skip that quickly <laughs> to go now to, that was example on sound, to go now to deep generative models. What's the difference? The difference now is that we are going to choose the scale so that it Gaussianize, but so that the points can be discriminated. In other words, two examples, xi and xi prime, in the scattering domain should be a little bit more far away. In other words, this has to be bigger than the distance between xi and xi prime, so it's a Lipschitz condition for a factor alpha which is not too small. If that's true, then you can invert your scattering transform. That's what we're going to do. So here is the encoding. We begin with x. We do the scattering transform. Then we do a whitening with a linear operator. And we're going to get a white noise, which is nearly Gaussian if the scale is big enough. Then you have the decoder. The decoder, so that's our predefined phi, takes white noise inverts the whitening operator, and then is going to invert the scattering transform with a generator. And what this generator does, it's essentially a regularized inversion. A regularized inversion by the fact that you impose that your inversion has to be good on each of the xi. What is the discriminative metric we are going to use? Either we use identity, not such a great example, or we, you, we would like to use something very close to the scattering transform. But we are going to mix a little bit less than this one, which you want to Gaussianize. So it's going to be a scattering transform at a fine scale. Let me show you results. So that's on a set which was trained with polygons. Okay, So you had polygons of different colors and different shapes. This is what you recover by inverting the scattering transform. It's not very surprising. These are very sparse signals in the uh, um, scattering uh, over wavelet coefficients. Now, what about faces? These are examples of faces. This is still on the training. 
That's the inversion of the scattering transform of these faces. And you can see that they are very blurry. They are very blurry because any movement, any deformation is going to be killed by the L2 norm. The L2 norm prefers to blur things rather to have anything which is not at the right location. If you put a discriminator, so uh, by the way, the results have just been computed uh, one or two days ago, so all these are very preliminary results. If you use a discriminative metric to do the inversion, which is uh, itself a scattering transform, but at a finer scale, you begin to recover the high frequencies. Okay, these are on the training example. On the testing example, these are, testing examples means what? I take an example that my network has never seen, I compute the scattering transform of my example, and I generate it again. I invert the scattering transform. In the case of polygons, the inversion works well. In the case of faces, same thing, it's blurred if the discriminator is identity, and you begin to recover the high frequencies if you use a slightly more sophisticated discriminator. Okay, interpolations. What you're going to see as a video is an interpolation between two reconstructed images by changing the variable z. What is the variable z? It's just the scattering transform whitened. But then you do a linear interpolation. And you can see how when you reconstruct, you just get a deformation exactly like in a GAN. And that's for faces. So that was done with identity, so you see the, the blur. But you can see that one deforms into the other. You have exactly the same phenomenon. Now, what if you put random noise? If you put random noise in the system, that's why with faces, you restore faces, so random norms. And again, I haven't learned any discriminator or embedding. For shapes, you can recover geometrical shapes. They are not perfect. That's what we got as today. Now, I want to show you how you do exactly the same thing now with time series. You begin with x, same thing. You are going to compute a scattering transform. You are going to whiten your scattering transform and get this. However, in time, you would like everything to be causal. You want that one time coefficient is computed from the past. So, the scattering transform has to be computed with causal wavelets. That's done with in audio uh, wavelets which are called gamma tones. The whitening has to be causal. How do you whiten linearly a time series? You use an autoregressive filters. In other words, you predict the value of the time series at the time t here plus 2 to the j from the past coefficients plus a white noise error that has been transformed by a covariance. How do you learn these matrices? You just solve the, your worker equations. And then you invert this, so that gives you an autoregressive model, and then you invert the scattering transform with a deep network by minimizing a distance. I'm going to show you that this gives you essentially the architecture of the new generation of wavelengths. So here's what's happening at large scale. At large scale, you've computed the scattering transform. You are doing a prediction at this very large scale with a simple autoregressive Gaussian model. Okay, so for this, you put, sorry, that's the very large scale, that's the noise. So you create a new noise vector. From the new noise vector, you are going to create, with your autoregressive model, the first coefficients. Now then, at the layers below, you are going to use your convolution network. So, from these coefficients with a convolution along this, with zeros in between, you are going to create these two coefficients, or these two arrays of coefficients. At the next scale, you again apply, you are going to create these four. And at the largest scale, you are going to get a whole block of 2 to the j coefficients. Okay? So you are constructing like that with a simple autoregressive at the top, all the other coefficients. And here's what it gives. 
So on the training, Ready. that's the original signal. It's a small piece. That's the generated uh, with this uh, network. Ready. So on the training, it works about OK. That's each time I show the spectrogram. You can see the spectrogram of the training is about the same, which means that you basically recovered it. Now, on testing signals, so you give to your network a signal it has never seen. You compute the scattering transform. You try to see if it can invert it. That's the original. You will see the reconstructed. Not perfect quality. We didn't use enough. We use very few, in fact, examples in order to produce it for this morning. Uh, these are the results. And that, these are other examples. Okay. Oh, sorry. That's the generated. Now, random generation. So you put random noise. You compute the scattering transform. You predict at very large scale. And then you recreate the coefficients. Here's what you get. So this has been trained on speech. This is a spectrogram. For me, the remarkable thing is that you recover something which looks like speech and which has all the harmonic structures of speech. The audio is here. Not perfect, but that's after five days of work on the numerics. Now, I'm going to show you what it gives if you use a metric which is a Euclidean metric. Essentially, all the high frequency disappears. You see here, that's the high frequency. You can recover high frequency harmonics. Here, everything disappears if you recover a metric which is Euclidean. This is another example. You see the spectrogram of Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the audio here. Okay, now, the choice of scale. I want to show you that the scale is very fundamental. If you don't Gaussianize enough, in other words, if you don't average enough, the reconstruction is going to be not as good. So, what you're going first going to hear is the reconstruction with a relatively large scale, which was about 1,000 coefficients. Now, same thing with a scale which is much smaller. You see basically the intermittent structure and the harmonic structure doesn't exist. Now, if you do that on other examples, you have exactly the same phenomenon. So, what does that show? That shows that, basically, if you choose an intermediate scale with a priori information, you have all what it, you, you need in order to build your generator. You can then do warping also in audio. So, this is a signal generated with a white noise. This was a second signal generated with a white noise. If you average the two, you get something which is the average, so you basically have the two voices. If you average in the Z domain and you reconstruct, you get something which has the intermittency of an audio signal. Oh, I even have five minutes advanced then. Okay, so what's the conclusion about all that? The conclusion about all this is that I don't think you need to learn the two and make the problem so complex. I'm not saying that uh, you cannot get absolutely optimal results with learning, but what I'm saying is that the kind of results that are currently being obtained over images and for audio, I think that with work we can reach a pretty good quality, can be obtained basically by setting the whole problem as an inverse problem. Once you set the whole problem of, as an inverse problem, basically you have a tractable pro mathematical problem and you can incorporate all the prior information you have about the system, in particular in the case of physics, in order to limit the number of examples that you need for learning. 
The second thing which comes as really interesting when you analyze these things is that the generators are behaving as a kind of memory system, okay? It's the generator which is uh, getting the patterns. In our case, we know very well what is the embedding. And we know that the embedding has no information about the original structures. The embedding is a completely fixed operation. So we know that all the information is in the generation. And if you look at the generator in a little bit more detail, in our case, because we know that the generator is inverting a fixed function, you can look at the intermediate layers. And the intermediate layers are progressively building sparse representation of the original embedding built from the examples that you had in the training uh, set. In some sense, it's building a kind of distributed memory of the original information in the training set. There are very beautiful questions around that. What is the memory capacity? How much can you store in given networks? Do you need an absolute, for example, there were papers recently showing that with GAN, they essentially eliminate uh, uh, some of the examples and don't restore them. How much memory do you need in order to guarantee that you store all the information and you can recover high frequencies? And in general, what is the entropy of the resulting process? What are their properties and so on? So these are questions which are completely open, but I think that there is hope to make the whole thing a little bit less complex than it is now. Thanks.